Mark Congor, in a book entitled Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage, has a, a most interesting section that I want to read as an opening illustration, and then I'll tie it together on what we're doing in our booklet, and we're going to go to page three in the booklet. He starts out by writing this, men and women are different, we just are. Our bodies are obviously different, our behavior is different. And as it turns out, our brains are different too. Why would God create us to be so different? For two reasons, he writes. He wanted each of the sexes to face ourselves so we could discover our strengths and our weaknesses. And number two, he wanted us to learn to depend on each other's strengths, which would end up covering for each other's weaknesses. Understanding the different ways men and women think and feel about life helps us more accurately interpret what is really going on in our marriages. He then writes a few pages later. He says this. Through the search, or though the search for brain differences is nothing new, the modern and more sophisticated hunt for differences between men's and women's minds and brains and how they developed and think began in the 1960s when researchers first discovered that a part of the hypothalamus uh, called the preoptic area was substantially larger in males than in females. The 1990s became the decade of the brain in modern science as research skyrocketed all over the world. And what have scientists found? As they discover and dig deeper, there are big differences between the male and female brains. The evidence is indisputable that these distinctions arise from biology, not culture. Somewhere between, and then I skip a couple of paragraphs, between 18 and 26 weeks into a pregnancy, a male baby's hormones, testosterone, start to kick in gear and results are significant. The bundle of nerve fibers, called the corpus callosum, connecting the right and left hemispheres of the brain start to disintegrate. This is in the male. The left side of the brain houses the logic and reasoning centers of the brain. The right side in the male child houses emotions, feelings, judgments about beauty and social relationships. It turns out that about 85% of men end up being left-brained thinkers. They are extremely logical in their approach to life, impacting the way they problem solve and act in relationships. Consequently, men are more task-oriented. Then he, I'm going to skip a few pages, and he writes this then. We men do not get in touch with our feelings easily, and it is precisely this struggle that women end up misinterpreting as lying. Men are therefore born to think unilaterally. We think in either the right or left hemispheres of our brain, but seldom in both at the same time. It is sort of like having two computers, one on the right shoulder and one on the left, but there is no interfacing cable connecting the two of them. They both work, but they don't communicate with each other in any meaningful way. way. Meanwhile, women, on the other hand, have no such breakdown between the two hemispheres. Plus, the female hormone estrogen prompts nerve cells to grow more connections within the brain and between the hemispheres while the female is still in the womb. The female connecting tissue doesn't deteriorate. Hence, the two hemispheres of their brains interact and process information together. Hence, women are more in touch with their feelings and can more easily express them than most men can. Because of brain differences, women have a more accurate, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, acute sense of smell, better hearing, and keener eye set on average than men do. He then goes on to write, men's brains are specialized, compartmentalized. Because of the separation of the two hemispheres, men must focus on one thing at a time generally. If you take a brain scan of a man while he is reading, you'll find he is virtually deaf. Okay? Before a man answers the phone, he asks everyone in the room to quiet down, the TV needs to go off, and the environment needs to settle before he picks up the receiver. A woman does no such thing. The TV can be blaring, she can have a baby on her hip and be in the middle of making dim dinner, and she simply picks up the phone without pause. Why? Her brain can differentiate among all the sounds and activities in a way a man's brain does not. Generally speaking, then, 
men don't multitask as well. It is, as, it is as if men's brains were a collection of little boxes. We have a box, as men, for everything. There is a box for the job, a box for the wife, a box for the kids, a box for the money, a box for mother-in-law, which we usually tape up and stuff somewhere in the basement, etc. <laughs> Basically, men have a box for all the important facets of their lives. And here's the basic rule. The boxes never touch. When an issue arises, men can reach for the appropriate box. We take hold of that box and slide it out, being ever so careful not to touch or disturb the other surrounding unrelated boxes. And then carefully pack it up and put it back among the other boxes until needed again. And then here's what I love about it and here's what I'm reading. There's a special box in a man's head that most women don't know about. This particular box has nothing in it. We refer to it as the nothing box. It's called that because it contains, well, nothing. It's just an empty box. And amazingly, of all the boxes stacked in a man's brain, his nothing box is his favorite box. Okay. <laughs> If given the opportunity, a man will always go straight to his nothing box. Ever wonder what a man is doing when he looks comatose and dead to the surrounding world for hours on end? Picture him fishing, channel surfing, or playing a video game. As long as the activity requires little or no mental energy, men love it. We revel and wallow in it like joyful pigs in the mud. Researchers have discovered that men do, in fact, have the ability to think about absolutely nothing. Then he goes on. Women can't think about nothing. Why? Because their minds are constantly abuzz, always reviewing, always processing numerous bits and bytes of information about what may or may not be happening. Consequently, a woman who doesn't understand the nothing box will surmise that her husband must be in a place of meaningful contemplation when he is quiet. Then, thinking he is surely primed for intimate, meaningful conversation, she engages him by asking a simple question. What are you thinking about? She inquires. Nothing. He replies glumly. Nothing? You have to be thinking about something. He pauses. No, not really. I was thinking about nothing. You're lying, she says with a hint of hurt in her voice. No one thinks about nothing. You just don't want to tell me. <laughs> Honey, I'm not lying, he says defensively. I was really thinking about Nothing. So off she goes, annoyed that he's holding out on her again. And all she wants to know is, why won't he share with me? The truth is, men love to think about nothing. It's kind of a cherished quality among our gender. Nothingness in every man's quiet world is his quiet reward in his life. In our search as men for great joy and peace, we men will look for the stone clearly marked, nothing. Nothing is the froth on the top of a man's life. Nothing is the reward for engaging in a day chock full of somethings. We love nothing. We relish in it. The problem is, this drives women crazy. Few men behaviors are more frustrating to a woman than when a man sits joyfully content doing, you guessed it, nothing. How can that just be? How can he just sit there she frustrates. Incapable of thinking about nothing, she fails to comprehend such a thing. Her mind is constantly flittering as one thought after another shoots across her mind with the precision of a skilled tightrope walker. She multitasks her way from one activity to another, which just adds to her angst as she observes her silent, I refuse to disclose my true feelings, husband. She concludes he must just have a cold, resistant heart. And all this time, she thought he was the one. I love that section in his book. I noticed something several years ago, about 20 years ago. And the reason I read that is, uh, and, 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 and this is a Christian uh, writer 
um, active in the evangelical church world, and he uses comedy and whatnot to make some very serious points. And he'll go on and develop it a little bit later. About 20 years ago, uh, in our culture, and we're going to be talking about family in that this morning, but something happened in our culture. Growing up, there used to be shows on television that I would watch as a kid. And For instance, it had the title, I don't know how many of you would remember this. It shows your age if you do. There was a show called Father Knows Best. Okay, so you're old too, all right? But <laughs> Father Knows Best used to be a television show. And, and so there would be all these frustrating events of the day, and then Dad would come home, and he would solve everything. And then about 20 years ago in our culture, something started to roll reverse. You had Tim Allen had a show, and I can't remember the name of the show. I think it was called Tool Time. What was it called? Home Improvement. Home Improvement. And he had a, uh, his TV show. He was to be a, 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 a home improvement. He had the show called Two Time. And he might have been, and he's got the image thereafter that the husband and the father was the dumbest man in the world. Actually, what he would, where he got his wisdom, after, he would go and talk to his, what was his neighbor's name? Wilson, who you never saw his face. All you saw was the top of his hat and his eyes over the back fence. And he would share then his omniscience with Tim and Joe. And then he would go back in and he would tell his wife what he learned and she would just roll her eyes because she had figured it out long ago. And even the kids who were little had figured it out too. Dad became the dumbest man in the world. Because Tim and most men loved their nothing box. Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? Our culture began to degrade and actually do role reversals in the home. How can dad possibly be the head? Okay. He's got nothing in it, if you understand what I'm saying. And our society has bought into that lock, stock, barrel. That's where we're at today. As a matter of fact, we look and we laugh at that, and it's just become commonplace in most movies and whatnot. That's just the scenario. That's the day now in which we live. I use that illustration because the way that people now look at the home is a microcosm of also the way that people look at not just Christian, but look at Christianity in our world. You people are, well, we feel sorry for you. You just don't know. You just don't get it. So they either feel like we are completely marginalized and off to the side because we are pre-modern in a sense. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I mean by using the terms we used last night? You're kind of living in an ancient biblical world that still believes in things like creation. See? And you believe in some of those archaic mindsets, worldviews is the term. A worldview that God created. One man took away all the sins of the world. And you actually believe that stuff. And your eternity is dependent on one person. See? Which means you're let off the hook. You just say you put your faith and trust in a finished work of somebody in a bloody death where he was a political prisoner, got caught in the machines of the Roman Empire. And now you've taught to believe it. You've, you've bought into that. I can even present it from the pulpit this way that it starts to cause flashes, those momentary, like the flickering TV screen, flashes of doubts in our own mind. Hey, maybe we did buy into it. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay. That was what was happening in the Corinthian church. Believers had gotten saved, and we're in 2 Corinthians now. They had gotten saved, and they were doing all right when the Apostle Paul had come and initiated them into truth and explained to them and demonstrated truth 
from the Word of God. And some of these Jews who knew the Old Testament, but others who had never heard the Scriptures, had never heard of Christianity, started to listen to Paul demonstrate via fulfilled prophecy, etc., the veracity, the truthfulness of the Word of God. And they, in turn, put their faith in Christ, and their lives were changed. Paul leaves, travels on in his, as it were, missionary campaigns, and time lapses. And in the time lapse of his departure and absence from them, the culture starts to impinge and infringe upon their belief structure. And they start to become, again, the frog in the kettle. And as the culture turns up its heat, they start to realize, I need to listen to Wilson and gain some wisdom. And they start to feel stupid in the world. And then they write to Paul after he starts, and they, and they start reverting back to some of the natural, carnal habits of their life. Paul even writes, I hear that there be some carnally minded among you. All right. right. Instead of being, I wish that you were spiritual, but now that you are carnally minded, I will write to you that way because you're, you are a believer, but you're living after the appetites and the appeals of the flesh in the world around us. And so he challenges them, and this is where we left off last night, and they respond after he writes that first letter, who do you think you are? And he writes to validate and vindicate his apostleship before them, though he says in 2 Corinthians, I shouldn't have to because you know better. You are an epistle written on your hearts. You know the change that took place in your life because you believe the message. You know this. And then he says in response, here's why, and this is the reason 2 Corinthians as an epistle has been encoded and preserved for, uh, forever. Heaven and earth are going to disappear. Okay. But this letter is going to last forever. The word of God will never fail. Okay. And he explains in to me, which is one of the most theologically filled chapters in the Word of God, 2 Corinthians 5. Here's why I live, and this is for you. This isn't about me. It's for all of us. Here's why we live the way we live, and this is what we're going to demonstrate to the world around us. We live the way we do. We think the way we do as believers. We act the way we do in this culture that is so and growing so anti-Christian, anti-Christ, and as this culture becomes more anti-biblical, anti-Christian, anti-Christ, Paul gives three reasons why he lives the way he does. And the simple of those reasons is the very first one found on page three of your notes, and that is, I have an assurance. And I'm going to work through this passage of Scripture for the next few minutes. If you can join with me, please, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm going to take us through this rather quickly if I can. Then we're going to take a little bit of a break. Then we'll come back. And then we're going to take on section 2 of our notes for an hour. And then we're going to break for just a few minutes and then finish up in the last 30 minutes. But Paul will say, this is what motivates me is this assurance that I have. And I find this in verses. And by the way, let me say, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is, is a passage in Scripture that if you shake your Bible like this, grammatically, meaning in the original language, as well as in your English Bible, the outline's going to fall right out. You don't even have to worry. It's just there. Verses 1 to 8 is one section that says, I have an assurance. And this assurance is, is as he talks about this, is... It, it, it has three components to it. I have something. I know something. And these three components come together. And they're really talking about this life and the life to come. There's more to life 
than our pleasure and our happiness and our goals and my retirement and everything else in these 60, 70, 80 years. There's really more, and, 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 and that's kind of a good thing, okay? Because now I'm getting towards the latter chapters of my life, okay? And as I'm, I'm, I'm not young anymore, and I'm not going to tell you how old I am because it's really it's depressing to roll it across my lips, okay? And some of you are older, and that'll offend you, okay? But I'm really about it. I'm getting right up there with the oldest people in the room. And, and, and you go, well, you don't look like you. You look like a bald teenager. No, no, I'm not, okay? I'm really getting old. But the, here's the bottom line to that. There is something about aging, and that is as time goes by, you do start to get a little more serious about stuff. Um, grandparenting is a whole lot easier than parenting was. When I was a parent, why is parenting so hard? Because I'm worried about, am I doing it right? I mean, I was a young pastor with kids. And, and I wanted to make sure that we're doing it right to set an example for the rest of the church. And so whether it was disciplining or whatever, we just had to make sure we're doing it right, okay? And so, you know, the right everything. Corporal punishment, we got to set the right example, make sure we have that down, right? So I used a ping pong paddle, big surface, et cetera. I mean, I got to do everything right, and I want to be politically correct, but at the same time, biblically right there. I want to do it all right. And, you know, and so one of the kids would not sit up straight. I'm, you know, and just want these perfect children, I don't know what, I, I, bottom line, what was I thinking anyway? But and then I become a grandparent, and it's like, yeah, don't sweat it, it'll be fine, you know. <laughs> and, and I watch my kids, and they're just panicked, and I just sort of smile, my wife looks at me, we wink at each other, and uh, we'll take the grandkids for a couple of days, and they're worried about, you know, we don't want to spoil them or whatever, Pfft. When the kids are born, Lucy says, give me the credit card. She just goes out and buys everything. You know, these little bitty shoes that cost 100 bucks for a baby. You know, it's like, <laughs> and I'm going, take, buy two pair. I think they're just, you know, <laughs> you can't give them enough. You know, it's, grandparenting is just really different. But you also, you look at life differently, but you really look at life seriously. And you start to understand some things. And that's what Paul does. And so let's exegete this passage. Pull some things out that really become important to you and me. And it's not about, and, and, and here's what I want to do between now and, and an hour and a half from now. Um, I remember in my doctoral program down at Dallas Seminary sitting in a class and I, and I think it was, we, we, I was with Dwight Penn. I had two teachers. There were six students and there were two profs. Dr. Dwight Pentecost was one of them. And the other one was Dr. Stan Toussaint. And the two of them were leading a class in uh, Luke Acts. I was taking a Greek study in Luke Acts. Um, and uh, I remember Dr. Pentecost, who at that time was an octogenarian. He was in his 80s. And he says, you know what I have noticed in my career um, and, and now in my ministry is I go to church today. It's really different than 30 years ago. Uh, and that was, uh, and I was doing that 25 years ago in my PhD program, but he was going, it used to be when I would go to church on Sundays, they would preach about going home and life at home. And he would, he pointed upwards, okay? We preached a lot more, there was a lot more preaching about this years ago. Most of the preaching I hear today is about going home. You understand what I mean? It's relational and how to live in relationship today. Years ago, it used to be a whole lot more about living in relationship to God. What Paul is going to do is put up, he's going to slam on the brakes and say, you're going to get this down really well living in our culture if you understand this. Does that make sense? So let's talk about this for a few minutes, and that'll take care of itself. All right? That's where he goes. Because the problems the Corinthians were having was everything about this, their relationships with each other. Paul says, your problems with this stem from your problem with this. 
You getting my metaphor or you understand what I'm talking about? It's if you got this done with God right, the stuff with people is going to fall lockstep into it with no problem. So he begins this. He starts to talk about what he calls the promise, a promise of a better life, an assurance that he never doubts. And here it is. He understood what it is, what this life is really like. He says, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent, it's interesting terms, is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Do you see all that? That one verse is freighted, loaded with meaning. Let me unpack it real quickly. He, he, he refers to the life you and I are presently living. And I don't mean our culture. I mean the, the breathing physical life that you and I are living. Let's put it into perspective. He describes it as an earthly house. This earthly house. Now, look this way for a moment. Dave Burgraff um, lives, as it were, in a body. Okay? I have a home in Cary, North Carolina, 117 Jameson Woods Lane. It's a town home there. And Lucy and I live in a town home now. And as we have that home, that house, 117 Jameson Woods Lane, is not me. It's where we live. You and I have the idea that I am a body. This is the essence of me satisfying, prettying it up, and I've worked at it, and it ain't getting any prettier, okay? But this body and what you see as handsome as it is before you, okay, is not the whole me. I am a spirit being living in a body. This body is going to be put in the ground and it's going to return to the environment and it'll become part of the atmosphere and the grass, etc. No matter how I encapsulate it, that's what's going to happen to it. I will return to dust. I'm going to go on living. Do you understand? My body is what I am living in. The immaterial. We used to talk about, you know, dichotomy, trichotomy, you know, are you two parts or three parts? You don't need that discussion, okay? You have, in modern theology, we use the term, by modern I mean in contemporary theology, we use the term immaterial and material aspects, okay? The material aspect will return, the immaterial goes right on living. In case we miss the point, Paul says we know that if this earthly house of this tent, the word tent is the Greek word transliterated or spelled in English, S-K-I-N-O-S. That's how Greek words end. And we get our word what from it? Skin. So he says if the earthly house, meaning your body, were to be dissolved. And the word dissolved, or as you have it here, destroyed, it's the same Greek word, dissolved, destroyed. It comes from the term that means unpitched. It is literally, we, in, in when they wrote, they didn't use it. Unpitch, meaning you pull the tent pegs up. Does this make sense? What do you do with a tent? You take it down. You pull up the tent pegs. That's literally the terms. Because a tent is meant to be temporary. Thank you. Temporary. So the idea is, as he talks about that then, in this temporary dwelling that we have in this short space, period of time. And as we talked last night, if this room erupted in an explosion, you would remember everything. The immaterial part is the you. It's your personality. It's your memory bank. It's you. And the rich man being in hell lifted up his eyes and he remembered. 
Jesus uses those terms very specifically because there's only two passages that really talk about what happens at the moment you die, that passage and this one. We have, he understands what's beyond this, we have, if this is unpitched, okay, we have, we possess an assurance. We have this is the idea. We have, and it's a present reality. It's yours already, a building from God, meaning a building as compared to a tent is what? Permanent, solid, has endurance, lastingness. A building of God, that's the source, not human parents. A house not made with hands. It's adapted to the spiritual realm. And then he goes on and he just keeps building. Eternal, okay, never wears out, never dies, ages or changes in the heavens, meaning immortal life after this one. And I said last night, eternity has already what? Begun. We presently have this guarantee. Okay, this new life now, the afterlife is now. Now go on. He has a guarantee from God that it's real. That's the second component to bring into this assurance. Notice real quickly, for in this, in this body, notice in verse 2, we groan. And it means the idea, notice in your notes, in this tent, this temporariness, we sigh because of the... That's what life is like. He says, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. I'm just going to read this out and then come back and comment. For we who are in this tent, in this skin, we groan being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Very poetic language, but it's not meant to be poetry. It's meant to talk about death is, frankly, ugly. Okay? Um, and Paul's, we, if I could put it this way, I would like to get on with it. As weird as this sounds, I am not afraid of death with these promises. I don't want to go through dying. Does that make sense? I mean, the prospect of, Dave, you've got cancer, and here's how we need to treat it, but there's not much we can do, and here's how it's going to go. And, and I've had friends who have, when I was growing up, one, one, and my dad owned an auto dealership and we owned a gas station and the, across the United States there's this transport company named Wayne Transports. You may have seen these huge gas rigs and they pull fuel in that across country. Wayne Seamers owned that and he was a friend of our family and one of, and, and one of the brothers, Dale Seamers, there were several brothers that drove and they had this company together. And they're really huge in the Midwest and East Coast, especially up in New England area. And they run all the way to California and they have these gleaming red and white trucks, silver tanks and huge semis pulling gasoline, pulling fuel and, and specialty uh, fuel products like that. But um, Dale Seamers tried to avoid... Uh, he had left St. Cloud, Minnesota and was driving to Minneapolis and an older couple, and, and I'm 16 years old at the time, and I got the news and it shook me to my core and, because Dale was driving and, and an older couple had pulled out on a four-lane highway on Highway 35W in Minneapolis and for whatever reason, he couldn't stop that rig, but he, 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 the only way he could avoid hitting them with that huge truck full of fuel was to take it down the middle the middle of the the ditch and he hit had to hit then a, a a crossroad right there which caused the thing to explode he was trapped in the truck and uh and he's alive but burning to death and a highway patrol actually pulled up a huge man of a highway patrol ran in and he himself suffered 
severe burns trying to pull Dale up. But, when he, but, but he was so burned at the time that when they pulled him out, even his legs and some of his organs de, uh, detached from him, and then he, he died promptly there. I'm a 16-year-old at the time, and I knew him well. We used to visit when they would pull into the dealership, and we would talk when they would fill up and whatnot. And the thought of dying that way just rocked me to the core. That's a horrible way to die. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, it, you think about that for a minute. There are just horrible ways to die. Death is not. And there, we walk through a what? Valley, a shadow of death. Do you understand what I'm saying? And, and you hear things in, of people suffering, and Paul's talking about that. So in this we groan, we are, and, and the idea is, he says this, and, and, and here's what one uh, commentator writes, no wonder we groan. We groan because we are weary, rain-soaked campers longing for home. Remember the tent? But when we shed this earthly tent from our shoulders, we will not be left naked and shivering. We will be clothed with immortality. Now, here's what Paul does in verse 5. And by the way, what he is really talking about in verses 2, 3, and 4 is that when you do die, you get a temporary body. Did you know that? Jesus appears on the Mount of Transfiguration. James, John, Peter are also there. Do you remember this account in Scripture? In Matthew's Gospel, it details it. And while they are there, who do they see? Who do they see appear? Jesus now appears in his pre-incarnate glory. And who's there? Who? Moses and Elijah. Okay? And they are conversing with Christ. Okay? What happened to Elijah? He went to heaven, body, soul. Okay? Almost in a modern day rapture. What happened to Moses? Buried, died, returned to the environment in his body. And yet, there was no distinguishability when they appeared before the apostles. Make sense? Identifiable, recognizable, conversant, etc. A temporary body. That is not the resurrection body. The resurrection body happens later. Does it make sense? You and I have a temporary body upon death. We will recognize each other. We will converse. We will be together one day then to have the resurrection. And what Christianity teaches that's unique, the resurrection body is which body? What makes Christianity unique? It's not reincarnation. You don't just get a body. It's not resuscitation. It is a what? Resurrection, which means it is, this is the dynamic compared to Buddhism or any other religion. You get this one back glorified. Now, for many of you, hoorah. For me, bummer. Okay. Uh, <laughs> meaning, I've put in my order for five feet ten. All right. And so, understand what I'm saying? But it is this body. That is what makes Christianity unique from other re world religions in the afterlife. It's the resurrection of this body. And that is very, very biblical in its theology. Now, will that happen? Uh-huh. Paul says it's going to happen. Now, he who has prepared us for this thing is God, who also has given us the spirit, the earnest, the arabone is the Greek word, the spirit as a guarantee. One day Jesus will say, come up hither, and this body instantaneously will be translated and changed, all right? Resurrected. And the Bible talks about it will happen in an atomai of a second. Okay, how, how fast will that happen? In the moment of a thought. Okay, it's more than the twinkling of an eye. That's the twinkling of an eye means in a moment of a thought. How fast can you think? Okay. It's immeasurably fast. How do you know that there is eternal life? How do you know? How do you know God can change you? Paul says, remember what we were talking about? How do you know he can change your body? 
How do you know a resurrection is going to happen? I will use Paul as an example. Paul is a murderer on his way to Damascus with orders from the high priest to take Christians prisoners to bring them back and hold them trial and put them to death. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 9, while riding to Damascus, he is struck from a horse. He is converted. And the Saul of Tarsus is a completely changed man. At 21 years of age, I attended a church service in Minnesota, heard the gospel for the very first time in my life. That morning, both my wife and I, we were married, received Christ as Savior. We became and started on a pathway of discipleship, but that day were completely changed. In the months that followed, people would ask, what happened to you? I received the earnest of the Spirit. And by the way, this becomes very, as it were, personal for each one of you, but every one of us has the same story. You, I don't know yours personally, and you don't know mine. We share testimonies, and every one of them is kind of the same. This is what we were, and we're completely different. You buy a home, and you put down what? Earnest money. 5%, 10% down. Earnest money says there's more to come in the future. One day the transaction will be completed when we bring all the details together. And at that time then full payment will be received and the deal is consummated. It's done. And it is yours. But for all intents and purposes, the bank, the electrical company and others, they refer to it as your home your house, even with just earnest money down. For all intents and purposes, the transaction has taken place. When you got saved, 5 or 10% of the power, as it were, now full 100%, but the Spirit of God dwelt in you and completely changed you. Completely changed you. Not the tent, changed you. Not the skin us, but changed you. And when Jesus appears and says, come up hither, it is absolutely nothing for him to change the remaining, the dust, back into life. Because the really hard part, the immaterial part, he's already changed. You understand what I'm saying? Paul said, it's already happened. Bringing the dust out of the ground. I mean, it was nothing for God to do that to Adam. He took inorganic materials, brought them together, organic materials now, in the Spirit of God. In the Spirit of God, there was a planet. And any time there was life in plants, in the water, with the dust that becomes life, that's the work of the Spirit. What did the Spirit do in creation? He's the life causer, the breath of God, as it were, the Holy Spirit the third person of the Trinity, a real person, is the life causer. And anywhere that there's life, it's been caused by the Spirit. That's what he does. He animates the inanimate, and he causes life. And where the Spirit of God is, there is life. And he's already living in you. And so is the Son, and so is the Father. The Trinity of God is alive in you. It's going to give you life. Paul says, that's guaranteed. And because of that, you have a confidence and can have a confidence about the future. Notice. So we are always confident. Do you see that in verse 6? Knowing. And he started out in verse 1. For we know. Here he builds on it now in verse 6. Knowing. Always knowing. That while we are at home in the body, we are what? Absent from the Lord. We are confident. I love that Greek word. Okay. There are certain words that just sound cool. Okay. I heard words and I studied French for years and one of my favorite words in French. It's just having been in the military for years and, and, and I'm, a, I'm a man born out of time. Okay. Um, for me, 
uh, I see and I love the era of the knights, okay? And, um, and maybe because I studied, a lot of my studies deal with the Middle Ages, but castles and knights and, and chivalry. I just see me as a knight doing chivalrous things and, you know, leading an army for the cause of Christ, chivalrous, and throwing down your cape for a, my wife to walk across the water, chivalrous. Sounds kind of cool, doesn't it? And so words that describe, you know, fighting for the Lord like fromage. Okay, and it's just a neat sounding word in French, doesn't it? Fromage. <laughs> Problem is, it's a great word with a wrong meaning. It means what? Cheese. That's like, well, that's stupid. Okay, but fromage. But the Greek word here that is used that we are confident is the Greek word theruntes. Sounds neat, doesn't it? Theruntes. Say it with me. The runtes. And it doesn't mean cheese. It means of great courage, confident, assured of this. And it means we do not back away. We believe this. We have this confidence, certainty. For we are always the runtes, knowing that while we are at home in the body. We are absent from the Lord. And we do this. We walk by what? Faith, not by sight. Yes, we are theruntes. Well pleased rather to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. I'd rather be there. But in the meantime, we're here. Amen? That's what we have. We're going to keep going into our notes Let's take a break for a few minutes, um, and then we'll come back. Pray with me, really. That, pray with me for a moment that God would really solidify in our hearts the fact that we have a reality. Father, thank you for what Paul records here. Here's why I live the way I do, because I'm thinking of the future and the worthness of this, that this life, is much more than this life. This Christian life is much more than these few years. It's a forever, and it's worth it. Draw that, drive that home deep into our hearts and our minds, please, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.